All right. In uh, the next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, analyzing uh, PDFs. So uh, the previous one, we did some kind of hand editing and explored the PDF file a bit. Uh, the next one, we're going to do analysis of the PDFs. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, important things to keep in mind is just um, I'm using, I've tested this uh, file with Python 3, so just keep that in mind. Um, go ahead and uh, get it just so that it's in my analysis folder. So I'm going to start with this file, but um, or I'm going to start by analyzing with the tool that I put together uh, during the lecture. Um, but I'm going to first talk about, um, you know, we went through um, the minimal PDF that you see over here uh, in the last lecture. I'm not going to use that one. Um, what I decided to do was actually um, go in here and do the um, do the print to PDF uh, feature. So print to file, print to PDF. So I should get a PDF that looks more or less like the page that you see here. And uh, if I open it up right here, you can see that I do have it. So here's the printout of this page that I did earlier. Um, so the reason I'm doing this is just to get a slightly more complicated PDF uh, that I can explore uh, using the tools and also um, you know, using a little bit of the uh, analysis work that we uh, that we discussed in the in the lecture notes. So. So I've got this um, list object, so I'm going to make it executable. So list objects, right? Um, I'm going to run it on the demo PDF that we looked at before. Um, so, so you can see the four objects there are identified and then uh, are each extracted um, and then um, the length is computed for every single one of them. So what I did here um, is very similar to the approach that um, that a lot of tools like PDF parser and so forth will use, which is rather than trusting the length that is defined uh, within the object, um, I actually just read the length, um, you know, uh, that's right here. So that's the PDF that we looked at before. The next one um, is this hello PDF that I brought up. So you can see it's a lot more complex. Instead of having four objects, looks like it has um, maybe uh, 28 objects. So uh, the other thing that is interesting about this is that um, you can see that the objects aren't always in order. So they go three, four, and then two. Um, Object five is all the way down here. Object one is all the way down here at the bottom. So they also range in different sizes. You have some that are only nine bytes in length and you have others that are 10 kilobytes in length almost. So this is a more complicated example. Um, I have it up here. Uh, one thing that we aren't gonna be able to do is um, just because of the uh, complexities of how it does the encoding uh, to try and save uh, content spaces. I'm not going to be able to search for this exact um, text in any one of these um, in any one of these uh, objects using the command line tools. Uh, one thing I will say is that um, There's a nice useful tool called PDF to text. Um, this one up here, which is part of the XPDF reader project. So if you install that package, um, that can be very helpful if you're trying to pull text content out of a, um, out of a PDF. So I don't actually have this um, documented on the page and I should probably add it. Um, but what you can see is that 
I've now created a new hello.txt. And if I open up hello.txt, you can see that the text content from that web page is actually here. So PDF to text can be really helpful if um, you want to pull out all the text content from a uh, from a web page. So, but uh, then I like you know use that list uh, objects tool. So here it is in all its glory. You can ask uh, you can access it on the on the web page as well. Um, this is a very good. Um, I attempted to be pretty verbose uh, with the documentation of what's happening at each one of the steps, um, but this is a very good parser template. Uh, if uh, it's helpful to you to kind of um, <clears throat> kind of have a hands-on um, trial and error sort of a learning approach, um, this is a very good place to start um, because it's uh, relatively straightforward. It's not it's not using a lot of the uh, complex language features that um, the say PDF tools, uh, which is the tool that I go into next, um, uses. <laughs> That said, it also doesn't have a lot of the features that PDF Tools has, so I will say that um, I'm going to switch over to PDF Parts really quickly. Um, but I'm going to first uh, make a mention that um, Didier Stevens has uh, a number of uh, videos on his YouTube channel, so I linked to the entire channel here. Um, these four uh, really kind of relate to the work that we're doing. Uh, they go a bit uh, beyond. Uh, what we're doing, but uh, you can see that there's a very similar exercise uh, using a different PDF generation tool. So OpenOffice or LibreOffice, which is basically the free office suite that's available to, uh, that's available if you want to have an alternative to Microsoft Office, it's platform independent, has the capability of exporting to PDF very similar to Office and what I did in my web browser and uh, everything like that. Um, it also does a uh, malware analysis uh, video as well. So all of these are really useful um, to, to view, and I'd recommend uh, going there. Uh, so PDF Parse is by far his um, most popular tool, but it's really important also keep in mind that he's got a PDF ID tool uh, that, does a, um, uh, that does a feature analysis of PDFs and tries to give you a uh, kind of a readout of the different features that are implemented and which ones are more frequent than others inside of a PDF file. And then finally, he also has a make PDF library tool, which uh, has the ability uh, for you to uh, manually craft a PDF based upon creating document objects. So very similar to a, uh, like a, a DOM document generation tool that you may use to create an XML or HTML document. If you've ever had to do that programmatically, uh, he's got a PDF generator as well. So for any of you who uh, want a, a way to automatically generate PDFs from data, um, that might be helpful. Uh, he uses it a lot for recreating um, uh, recreating attacks. So I'm going to jump into the PDF parser tool. So I've got it here. Uh, one of the things that I'll just say is that I have PDF, I have Python version 2.7. Um, his tool uh, dates back to earlier than 2010, uh, so before Python 3 came out. And the syntax in the tool hasn't really been updated since then um, to match with Python 3. So just a FYI, if you're having trouble running it and you're getting errors, make sure you're running version Python 2 or Python version 2, um, and uh, uh, before you, um, you know, before you worry. So I'll run the PDF parser. You can see uh, all the help text is here. So one of the first things we'll do is a uh, statistical analysis. So I got it highlighted right here. So we'll do a statistical analysis of the hello.pdf, or actually we can I'll do it for the demo PDF first. So I'll do the same exercise I did before, right? So I'll do it for the demo PDF, which is the one we looked at in the last video. Uh, and then the hello PDF. So the simple PDF followed by the more complicated one. So you can already see the big differences here. 
So this one is the old one or the previous one that we did. There's only four objects in it, whereas the one that I'm analyzing right now has 28 objects. Um, there's only three object types that are used in the uh, in the demo PDF, the one that I hand wrote or hand edited. While there's uh, a number of extra ones, uh, well, mainly just two, right? These two font ones are defined here. So if you remember when we were editing that old that other PDF, um, the uh, the font was actually embedded within a um, within another object. So in this case, uh, they've actually declared the font uh, to be its own object. So I've got the PDF up here, and I may as well just go ahead and look uh, for the font. So we'll go ahead and do that now. So you can see that um, this has a font descriptor, which is right here. And then it also has a font. Uh, the little number next to these, so each one of these types has a number next to it. The number to the immediate right of it before the colon is actually the frequency for the number of objects within this document that are of that type. So in this case, um, there's six font objects in the document, and there's three font descriptor objects within the document. So I can walk through each one of those by looking for type, space, font, right? And maybe, yeah, like that, right? And so I can walk through the font descriptors as well as the fonts. So you can see that it defines the fonts here. So a lot of the information in here looks uh, looks very similar. So I'm not really certain what the uh, you know what the difference is, why there needed to be different fonts here, but um, but that's what they picked. Maybe there's uh, different font sizes or something like that. I'm not sure. <clears throat> then you can see there's another copy of it down there. So. In this case, the um, this content right here is slightly different, right? So for whatever reason, um, there's slightly different font sizes or slightly different fonts defined that use the same core font name. But um, well, in this case, it's a uh, you can see this one's Deja Vu Serif Bold, and the other one's just like the non-bold version. So it defines the bold and the non-bold as separate fonts within the document. So, and then they have a monospaced version as well. So the monospaced or the, uh, you know, where every single character is the exact same width, the fixed width character font as well is defined in here. So you've found three different fonts. Um, there's like two occurrences of each one of them for some reason. Um, <clears throat> and again, I'm not entirely certain why that is, um, but it's just something that we learned from the document. If I was to do analysis of this document um, and compare it you know, over time to a lot of other documents, I might have characteristics like that stick out to me uh, that might be indicative of uh, something unique about the, in this case, the Firefox browser that I used uh, to generate this PDF that might not be the same as uh, if it were to be generated with a Chrome web browser. So things like that are things that um, are worth keeping in mind. Um, as you're doing uh, analysis. So in this case, what I might do is I might go and say, uh, look at that catalog object. So object number 28, based on this right here. <clears throat> and then it goes and tells me that object number one is the uh, pages. So where the pages are defined, so that's right here. So what I would do is I'd go and walk to object one, and then object one tells me that it references 
the kids object down here. Now, one of the nice things that um, PDF Parser does is as it is walking through all the content down here, uh, PDF Parser will look for references like this. So this right here, the sequence of, of three characters separated by spaces is a reference. Uh, what it'll do is it'll pull each one of those wherever they happen to exist and it'll list them up here as references. So you can follow, so you can very easily walk through all the different references. So I might go and say, look at object number eight now. And so object number eight um, has three objects that it references. So it references the parent as object one. And we saw that parent-child relationship so um, in the previous PDF, right? So Acrobat and the PDF format in general have the ability to have a child tell the reader which object is its parent. And then the parent object is also able to define its kids. And it defines the media box that tells how big the sheet of paper is. Um, defines the contents. So the contents again um, is object three, uh, just like before. Uh, and then it also defines a resources object down here as object two. So I might go and look at object three. And object three says that references four, so it references um, object four which defines the length, right? So this is a very interesting uh, feature um, of, uh, of PDF, is that uh, in this case, um, compared to before, and let me see if I can find an example of this here. Um, yeah, so you can see that the lengths might be specified as numbers like that, or you might have the length actually embedded uh, within another object, so that one's 22. So if I was to go over here to object 22, you can see the length is just a number right here, right? So let me see if I go to hello PDF. I'm gonna open this, I'm gonna open this up right here, and uh, we will see what happens. We'll see what happens um, if I mess with object three's length, right? So let me go up here to the top. So object three is right here and it has the stream. And then object four is right here and it has the length, right? So maybe I can do this. One, four, seven, eight. And you can see it worked right there. So uh, the other thing that I might do is I might undo that and I might change this to refer to object 44. You can see it still works just fine. So going and messing with different um, portions of the document um, just to try and uh, see uh, what we can mess with here. So it says the contents. So all this stuff is actually embedded, I guess, in this stream right here. So this is where it can kind of get a little bit tricky. Um, so I'm gonna try to uh, look at that stream. So here's me looking at stream four. And uh, or me looking at, yeah, me lo looking at object. Well, I'm saying four, but I should do 44, right? We'll just do this just to see. Yeah. So there's not really a lot of content here, right? So it basically sees that as a um, more or less an empty object. Uh, it just has a number here. So it doesn't have a dictionary, which is what these things are. Um, and then object three is where the contents are located. And it says that um, it's using the flate decode filter. 
uh, which is basically a compression, a compression filter. You'll find that this is very common uh, in PDFs. So, you know, jumping back onto the, onto the uh, PDF source code here, um, what's readily apparent is that this data right here is binary data. So this is where, this is what um, Brendan was mentioning when he said that PDF's a binary format. Um, however, it has a, a plain text markup language. So it has the ability to store this binary data within it. Um, uh, but the commands and the keywords used to try to describe to the viewer um, how it's supposed to present everything, that's all this stuff that's in plain ASCII text. Uh, the dynamic that this introduces is that um, it's not uncommon, uh, or I should say it's not unexpected to encounter binary data within the middle of a PDF. Uh, whereas with some other file formats like um, HTML, for instance, or plain text, or um, Microsoft's RTF rich text format, um, all of those types of files um, are really expected to be um, ASCII, right? And not have a lot of binary data in them, if any at all. Um, so um, the reason that this uh, becomes significant is because um, the binary capability um, of a PDF means that the author of the PDF is expecting all of the binary data to be able to be replicated in memory uh, without, um, without getting manipulated or changed or modified um, by any of the readers that the user might be using. So if I take a exe file, for instance, and I want to embed it somewhere inside of the PDF, um, then I can be a lot more certain that that data is going to uh, live in memory and not become and not become corrupted or edited by any of the tools uh, that are being used by the user to view the PDF. So if I write an exploit that's trying to look for the presence of an exe uh, inside of the PDF content somewhere. If I find the beginning of it, I know that the rest of it, or I'm relatively confident that the rest of it's going to be in there, um, preserved verbatim. So you can see, <clears throat> I was able to view the uh, the data within the stream. So I'm going to go and look at the help here. Uh, one of the things that's uh, that's in here is the ability to dump the contents of a stream. So I can I can leave this at three for the third object. I can try to dump um, the contents, um, dump stream content to a file name. So maybe I want to try stream three dot dat, and then I'll give it my hello dot PDF, right? So when I run it, um, it's going to output the same behavior that it was doing before um, so that I still get this data. This allows me to not have to run the program twice to get the data. So it also, in the background, wrote uh, some contents out here to stream3.dat. So I'm going to open up stream3.dat. And uh, this one's really helpful because you can see that that's the first stream that's uh, in the file. And what we've done is we've extracted the raw data. So using just that dash D option, I've extracted the raw data that was living in here. Unfortunately, I didn't get a copy of the data run through this filter here. So every single stream that a PDF has in an object um, can optionally use a filter uh, that it needs to be passed through before it's ready uh, to be used uh, inside the application. <clears throat> so in this case, this is telling us that it has to run the flate decode filter. So, which happens to also be the same filter that we used, <coughs> which also happens to be the same filter that we used uh, on the on the lecture on the web page. Uh, so, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to run that through the filter using the dash F option. So it pr prints the same thing. Um, the difference being, and we'll scroll back up so you can see this, right? Um, the difference being that, um, oh, I don't actually have the file size up there. Um, oh no, it's right here. So 1479 was the old file size. 
So now I have a file that's maybe about five times bigger. And if I look at it, the stream three contains all of this information here. Um, now, I'll be totally honest, I don't know how this information uh, goes together to try to construct the file or, you know, construct this content. Um, however, I will say that um, it's not uncommon for text uh, to be encoded within the file uh, in a format that is different from the, you know, that's not human readable. Uh, and oftentimes that'll be um, because it helps with compression. So, um, you know, a great example, and those of you who've done any sort of, um, you know, code breaking or anything, this might not be a foreign concept to you, but, um, you know, in the English language, um, the distribution of all of the different letters that are used uh, for putting this together, and even in programming languages, um, is not evenly distributed, the usage isn't evenly distributed across all of the different characters. So some characters, for instance, you know, in this case, the brackets, right, or the semicolons, those are a lot more common uh, than, say, any other character uh, inside of a uh, programming language. Uh, so um, it takes advantage of this um, by mapping a lot of the characters and a lot of the character sequences to uh, some other data. Uh, in addition to that, it looks like there's a bunch of um, a bunch of information in here that's explaining uh, how to, you know, the dimensions and how to lay out um, different uh, pieces of text within the document as well. So, <clears throat> I'm not going to get uh, too much deeper into that one. But um, I just wanted to kind of show you <clears throat> some of the, um, you know, some of the concepts uh, that are in play um, using this uh, Hello PDF example. <clears throat> 